Chapter 9. Proceedings Preliminary to Process. Article I. Proceedings Preliminary to Extraordinary Process. Section 174. Proceedings when an injunction is sought. The bill of complaint praying an injunction, having been prepared and duly sworn to, as hereafter fully shown. The next step is to present it to some chancellor, or to some judge of a circuit, criminal or special court, and apply for a fiat for an injunction. The chancellor, or judge, after reading the bill, will endorse on it his fiat, or his refusal, and transmit it, in a sealed envelope, to the clerk and master of the court in which the bill is to be filed. The fiat is ordinarily as follows. Fiat for an injunction to the clerk and master of the chancery court at Naming the town where the court is held in which the bill is to be beamed. Issue a writ of injunction as prayed in the foregoing bill, on complainant giving bond therefore in the penalty of, naming the sum, December 4, 1890. S. A. Key, Chancellor. Complainant must give bond, or take the pauper oath if the fiat so authorize, before the clerk and master can issue the writ of injunction. The forms of fiats, bonds, and oath will be found in the chapter on injunctions. Section 175. Proceedings when an attachment of property is sought. If the bill seeks to have the defendant's property attached, it must contain the proper allegations and be duly sworn to. If the ground of attachment alleged in the bill is one of the grounds for which an attachment would lie in the circuit court, the clerk and master may issue the writ of attachment without a fiat but if the ground for the attachment is of a different character, the complainant must apply to a chancellor, or to a circuit, criminal or special judge, for a fiat. This application is made in the same way as when an injunction is sought, and the practice in granting or refusing a fiat, and in transmitting the bill to the clerk and master, is the same as in the case of injunction bills. Indeed, the same bill often prays for both an injunction and an attachment. If the attachment be granted by the clerk and master, or by a chancellor, or judge, the bond required by the statute, or the pauper oath in lieu, must be filed with the clerk before the writ can issue. The forms of fiats, bonds, and oaths, for an attachment will be found in the chapter on attachments. 176. Proceedings when a receiver is sought before answer. It sometimes happens that the immediate appointment of a receiver is desired by the complainant. In such a case, his bill, or an accompanying affidavit, must fully and particularly set out the urgency of the necessity. The bill must be sworn to, and must be presented to some chancellor, or to some circuit, criminal or special judge, who, if the case for an instanter appointment be made out, and good cause shown why notice of the application should not be given, will endorse over the bill, or on the paper attached thereto, an order appointing a suitable person receiver as prayed, and specifying the bond he must give and the duties he must perform. In such a case, the chancellor, or judge, may require the complainant to give a bond conditioned for the faithful discharge of the duties of the receiver, in which case this bond must be given before the receiver can act. The chancellor, or judge, may award a writ of possession, to put the receiver in possession of the property specified in the order appointing the receiver. On making these orders, the chancellor, or judge, will transmit the papers in a sealed envelope to the clerk and master of the court where the bill is to be filed. The forms of such orders, and of the bond, will be found in the chapter on receivers. Article 2. Filing of the Bill. Section 177. When and where the bill may be filed. Suits are commenced in the Chancery Court by bill, and bills may be filed in the office of the clerk and master of the Chancery Court at any time, whether the court be in session or not. They may be filed at any hour of the day or night, provided the clerk and master, or his deputy, can be found to receive them, and a prosecution bond, or pauper oath in lieu, is not a condition precedent. The bill must, of course, be filed in the particular chancery court that has jurisdiction of the person of the defendant, or of the subject matter of the suit, for, if the bill be filed in a chancery court that has no jurisdiction, the defendant can defeat the suit by plea in abatement motion to dismiss, or demurrer in determining the proper county in which to file the bill. The following rules must be considered. 1. Bills to divest, or clear the title to, land. 2. Bills to enforce the specific execution of contracts relating to realty. 3. Bills to foreclose a mortgage, or deed of trust, 
by a sale of personal property or realty, must be filed in the county in which the land to be affected by the suit, or on material part of it, lies, or, in case the trust deed or mortgage is for personality, the bill must be filed in the county in which such deed or mortgage gauge is registered. So, for, bills to recover land, whether in the nature of ejectment or detainer suits, and 5, bills to sell the lands of a decedent to pay debts, must be filed in the county where the land or a portion of it lies. 6, bills for the partition of land, or a sale of land for partition, must be filed in the county in which the land, or any part of it, lies, or in which the defendant resides, or, if all the claimants join in the petition, it may be filed in any county. 7, bills for dower or homestead, must be filed in the county where the land, or a portion of it, lies, or in the county where their husband last resided before his death. 8. Bills for the sale of the property of persons under disability, must be filed in the county where the property is, or where the person under disability resides. 9. Bills by one non-resident against another non-resident to subject the real or personal property of the defendant to the satisfaction of a foreign judgment must be filed in the county where the property is situated. 10. Bills to recover possession of personal property, in the nature of replevin or detenia suits, must be filed in the county in which the goods and chattels, or on material part of them, are or in which either of the defendants may be found. 11. Bills to enforce liens of mechanics, liens on boats, liens of employees of railroads, corporations, partnerships, and merchants, liens of contractors on railroads, or other liens on property, must be filed in the county where the property, or some material part of it, sought to be attached, is situated if realty, or is found if personality. 12. Bills against cities and counties, whether local or transitory in their nature, must be filed, 1, in case of a city, in the county wherein the city is situated, and, 2, in case of a county, in the court of the county sued, 13, bills for the appointment of administrators must be filed in the county in which the deceased resided at the time of his death, or in which his estate, goods and chattels, or effects, were at the time of his death. 14. Bills for the transfer of the administration of an insolvent estate, from the county court to the chancery court, must be filed in the county wherein the will was proved, or letters of administration granted, or where the personal representatives reside, or are served with process. 15. Bills against joint makers of negotiable paper must be filed in a county where a joint maker can be served with subpoena to answer. 16. If the complainant and defendant both preside in the same county, the bill must be filed in that county, unless the statute requires the bill to be filed in some other county. This rule applies to transitory suits and is subject to the preceding rules. 17. The bill may be filed in any county where the defendant, or any material defendant, is found, unless otherwise prescribed by law. The Chancery Court acts ordinarily in personam, unless, therefore, there be some statute expressly requiring the bill to be filed elsewhere, it may be filed in any county in which a subpoena can be served on the defendants or on any material defendant. This is the fundamental rule governing the personal jurisdiction of the court, and the exceptions to it are herein above stated. 18. The bill may be filed in any county in which the defendant, or a material defendant, resides, unless otherwise prescribed by law, and, if, upon inquiry at his residence, he is not to be found by the officer having the subpoena. He may be proceeded against by publication or judicial attachment. The exceptions to this rule are the same as those to the preceding rule. 19. Bills against non-residents, or persons whose names or residence are unknown, may be filed in the county in which the cause of action arose, or the act on which the suit is predicated was to be performed, or in which the subject of the suit, or any material part thereof, is. 20. Bills to attach property may be filed in any county in which the property, or any material part thereof sought to be attached, is found at the commencement of the suit. 21. Bills by distributees, or legatees, to enforce the payment of their distributive shares, or legacies, may be filed in the county in which the estate was administered. 22. Bills to enjoin proceedings at law may be filed in the county in which the suit is pending 
or to which execution is issued. 23. Bills for divorce may be filed in the county in which the defendant resides or is found, or in which the parties resided at the time of their separation, but if the defendant is a non-resident, or a convict, then the bill may be filed in the county where the complainant resides. 24. Bills by the state against corporations, usurpers and trustees, may be filed in the county where the office is usurped or held, or the corporation holds its meetings, or has its principal place of business, or where the trustees reside or are found. 25. Bills for a mandamus must be filed in the county where the land lies, when land is the subject of controversy, in all other cases, in the county where the defendant resides, unless he is a public officer or corporation, and then in the county in which the office is kept, or the corporation does business. In determining the venue, the complainant should consider 1. Whether the suit in any way affects the title or possession of realty, or any interest in or lien on realty, if so, the bill must be filed in the county where such realty, or a material part of it, lies, unless the statute expressly allows the bill to be filed in some other county. 2. If realty is in no way affected by the suit, and the action is transitory, then the bill may be filed in any county where the defendant, or a material defendant resides, or may be served with subpoena, unless the statute expressly requires the bill to be filed in some other county. 3. If there be more than one county in which his bill may be filed, he may file it in either as may suit his convenience. Section 178. Filing of the bill. After the bill has been duly signed, and, if necessary, verified, it must then be presented to the clerk of the court specified in the address, and asked to be filed. If the bill has not already been endorsed, the clerk should, thereupon, endorse it as follows. Endorsements on the bill. Number 284. John Jones, et al. Versus William Richardson, et al. Original bill. Filed, June 1, 1890. Kerry McAuf, C. and M. A. L. Evans, solicitor for complainant. If the bill has already been properly endorsed, the clerk will merely add to the endorsement the date, and in attachment bills, the hour and minute of the filing. Bills in chancery may be filed at any time, in term or in vacation. On the bill being received by the clerk, the suit is commenced. Section 179. When a pleading is considered filed. A pleading is deemed to be filed when it is delivered to the proper officer, and by him received to be kept on file. The clerk is required to note upon the pleadings the date of the filing, but this is not an absolute prerequisite, nor is the date conclusive upon the parties. It may be shown by parole proof that the pleading was filed at some other time. When the date of filing does not appear on the bill, it may be inferred from the date of the bond and of the issuance of the writ. If the opposite party does not, in due time, take advantage of the fact that a pleading is not marked filed, he will be deemed to have waived such irregularity, and will not be allowed to take advantage of it, after having taken some step which recognizes the pleading as duly filed. In general, a pleading is deemed filed when handed to the clerk, or to a person in the clerk's office authorized to receive it and the failure of the clerk, or deputy, to properly mark it filed should in no way prejudice the party filing it. Article 3, Proceedings in Reference to Costs. Section 180, Securing the Costs of the Suit, comma, after the bill has been duly signed, and if necessary, verified, it must be presented to the clerk of the court specified in the address, with a request that it be filed. This request should be AC accompanied with security for the costs of the suit or a pauper oath, but the bond or oath may be filed after the bill has been filed. The security must undertake to pay all costs that may, at any time, be adjudged against his principal, in the event it is not paid by said principal, and no omission, or neglect, to insert this undertaking in the bond will prevent the security being held liable as stated. All persons who file bills or petitions, requiring a subpoena to answer, must give this security for costs or take the pauper's oath, except the state, counties and municipal corporations are not accepted. Section 181, Form of the Bond for Costs. The old form of prosecution bonds is not in conformity with the present statutes, but inasmuch as the statute, by its own operation, writes the proper conditions in all prosecution bonds, any omission, or neglect, 
to insert these conditions does not impair their validity. The form of the bond is, therefore, immaterial, if there is enough of it to show that it was intended for a prosecution bond in the particular suit. To adapt the old forms to the present law, the following would be their form of a prosecution bond. Whereas, John Jones has this day filed a bill, in the Chancery Court at Wartburg, against William Richardson, and others, now we, the said John Jones, as principal, and Richard Rowe, as surety, acknowledge ourselves indebted to the said William Richardson, and his co-defendants, in the sum of two hundred and fifty dollars, but this obligation to be void if we pay all costs that may be at any time adjudged against said John Jones in said suit. This June 1, 1890, John Jones, Richard Rowe. The following form of bond will more nearly comply with the statute, and is more brief. Another form of prosecution bond, John Jones vs. William Richardson, et al. In the Chancery Court at Wartburg, we, John Jones and Richard Rowe, undertaking the penal sum of $250, to pay all costs that may at any time be adjudged against the complainant in said cause, in the event the same are not paid by him. This June 1, 1890, John Jones, Richard Rowe, or, the following obligation, written below the bill will constitute a sufficient bond, and is often adopted, especially where the solicitor himself secures the costs. Short form of a prosecution bond. We hereby acknowledge ourselves security for all costs adjudged against the complainant, in the foregoing cause. June 1, 1890. John Brown, Richard Rowe. It is, however, best to have the complainant himself sign the cost bond especially when he does not sign the bill in person. Such signing is proof of the retainer. Where a suit is by a firm the bond may be signed by a member in the firm name. If the clerk and master has any doubts as to the sufficiency of the sureties tendered on any bond, he should require them to justify, on oath, in writing. This justification may be written on, or beneath the bond, as follows. Affidavit of Justification by Sureties. State of Tennessee. County of Knox, John Brown and Richard Rowe, the sureties on the foregoing bond, being severally sworn, John Brown says that he owns property subject to execution, worth $1,000, over and above all exemptions and just debts, and Richard Rowe says that he owns property, subject to execution, worth $3,000 over and above all exemptions and just debts. Jurat, as in the form below small John Brown, Richard Rowe. Section 182. Taking the pauper oath. Any person, with the exceptions stated below, may file a bill, without giving security for costs, by taking and subscribing the following oath. Proceedings in reference to costs. Pauper oath. State of Tennessee, County of Jefferson, J. I. John Jones, do solemnly swear that I am a resident of said state, and that owing to my poverty, I am not able to bear the expenses of the suit I am about to commence, in the Chancery Court of Jefferson County, against William Richardson and Henry Johnson, and that I am justly entitled to the redress sought, to the best of my belief. John Jones, sworn to and subscribed, before me, June 1, 1890. D.H. Meek. C. and M. Where there are more than one complainant they must all take the oath, except in case of husband and wife, and then the oath of the husband, alone, is sufficient for both himself and wife. The oath may be taken before the clerk and master, or before the clerk of any court in this state, or before a justice of the peace, but not before a notary public of another state. The clerk and master is bound to accept the pauper oath, if tendered in lieu of a bond. He has no discretion in the matter. 1. The pauper oath cannot be taken by the following persons. 1. Non-residents of the state. If a resident after commencing his suit on the pauper oath becomes a non-resident he may be required to secure subsequent costs. 2. Persons suing for false imprisonment, malicious prosecution or slanderous words. 3. Persons suing for an absolute divorce from the bonds of matrimony. 4. Persons instituting in the Chancery Court suits cognizable in the Courts of Admiralty of the United States. 5. Informers bringing key town suits. 6. Persons filing a Riplevin bill. They may take the pauper oath as to the costs, but must, notwithstanding, give bond in double the value of the property. 2. The pauper oath can be taken by the following persons. 
on complying with the statutory requirements. 1. Next friends of married women in this state, on the next friend taking and subscribing to an oath that the married woman in whose behalf the action is begun, sick, is not able, and has not sufficient property, to bear the expense of an action about to be commenced, and that such married woman is justly entitled to the relief sought to the best of his belief. 2. Next friends of infants in this state, on the next friend taking and subscribing to an oath that the infant in whose behalf the action is begun, sick, is not able, and has not sufficient property to bear the expenses of the action about to be commenced, and that such infant is justly entitled to the relief sought, to the best of his, affiance, belief. 3. Guardians of idiots, lunatics and persons of unsound mind, appointed by any court of this state, on the guardian taking and subscribing an oath that he has no property of such idiot, lunatic or person of unsound mind out of which to bear the expenses of the suit he is about to commence, and that he verily believes that such idiot, lunatic or person of unsound mind is justly entitled to the redress sought. But he cannot bring a suit for false imprisonment, malicious prosecution or slanderous words, on the pauper oath. 4. Personal representatives of estates of deceased persons in this state, on the representative taking and subscribing an oath that he, as such personal representative, has no property belonging to the estate of the deceased, out of which to bear the expenses of the suit, and that he verily believes that the estate, for the benefit of which the action is brought, is justly entitled to the redress sought. The personal representative incurs no personal liability on account of such suit unless the court trying the same should be of opinion and adjudge that the suit was frivolous or malicious. 5. A non-resident who qualifies as executor or administrator, in this state, of a person dying in this state, and leaving assets here. 6. Persons suing for divorce from bed and board, on taking the ordinary pauper oath. 3. Requirements as to taking the pauper oath when the pauper oath is taken. 1. By next friends of married women or of infants, or. 2. By guardians of idiots lunatics or persons of unsound mind, or 3. By personal representatives, care should be taken to comply with the respective statutory requirements, for a pauper oath that materially varies from the requirements in the particular case would be a nullity, unless amended by leave of the court. The pauper oath may be taken, not only in lieu of the ordinary prosecution bond, but it may be taken in lieu of an attachment bond, or an injunction bond. It cannot, however, be taken by the complainant in a replevin bill, but may be in a detenue bill. A defendant to an inquisition of lunacy may appeal on the pauper oath. Section 183. Forms of pauper oaths. In addition to the form of a pauper oath in the preceding section, the following forms are given. Pauper oath by next friend. State of Tennessee, County of I, John Doe, as next friend of Mary Den, a married woman, or infant do solemnly swear that we are both residents of said state, and that said Mary Den is not able, and has not sufficient property to bear the expense of the suit begun this day, or about to be commenced, by me as her next friend, in the Chancery Court of said county, against Richard Rowe, and that she is justly entitled to the relief sought to the best of my belief, John Doe, sworn to and subscribed before me this day of, 190, O. K. C. and M. Pauper oath by a guardian op non compass. State of Tennessee, County of I. John Doe. By appointment of the county court of said county, guardian of Henry Doe, an idiot, lunatic, or person of unsound mind, do solemnly swear that we are both residents of said state, and I have no property of said Henry Doe out of which to bear the expenses of a suit I am about to commence, or have commenced, as said guardian, against Richard Rowe in the Chancery Court of said county, and that I verily believe that said Henry Doe is justly entitled to the relief sought, sworn to and subscribed before me this day of 190, John Doe, O, K, C, and M, pauper both by an administrator or executor, State of Tennessee, County of I, John Doe, as administrator of the estate, or executor of the will, of Henry Doe. Do solemnly swear that I am a resident of said state, and that as said administrator, or executor, I have no property belonging to the estate of said Henry Doe out of which to bear the expenses of the suit, 
which I am about to commence, or have commenced, in the Chancery Court of said county against Richard Rowe, and that I verily believe that said estate is justly entitled to the redress sought, John Doe, sworn to and subscribed before me this day of 190. O. K. C. and M.